Um, great. So just to remind you of where we are, we've been presenting a formal quantitative model, just like cognitive psychologists tend to do. And we started with the exemplar model. And that brought us to this uh, digression of multidimensional scaling. Because the exemplar model assumes that we can fit in the distances between concepts, between words, in order to derive their similarities. And those similarities are going to be what are feature in this loose choice rule, which will say the more similar that I am as an example to the examples in category A, the more likely that I'm going to call myself a category A relative to how similar I am to all of the other categories. Okay, and so this brought us into multidimensional scaling, which is just a mathematical technique um, developed uh, in the 1930s by Torgerson and also by Roger Shepard himself um, that will take a matrix of similarities or dissimilarities and it will convert it into these dimensional geometric representations where each of your items, each of your words or each of your concepts will be defined on a, a set of X, Y, Z, A, B, C coordinates. Um, okay, so we were talking about some of the utility of multidimensional scaling from an information compression perspective. Um, also related to that is you get better reliable measures of the similarities between two objects because any, if you have a whole bunch of objects you're comparing, any two objects may have noise in their similarity assessment, but you're constraining the solution so that the distance between these two points is going to be influenced not just by their own individual similarity, but by all of the matrix, matrix of other dissimilarities in the, in the network of concepts. Okay, so um, it has also been used to actually determine the psychological dimensionality of stimulus sets. Right? So you can use multidimensional scaling in order to figure out, hey, do people think about this set of concepts in terms of varying along two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, etc. And to do this, you use what is called the stress in the solution. And the stress in a solution of a multidimensional scaling is the extent to which the geometric representation that you end up deriving after MDS um, well approximates the actual matrix of distances that you fit in. The bigger the stress, the less well this is doing a good job of aptly capturing the distances. We know there's more numbers here than there are here, so we know that there is the potential that you're not going to be doing a good job of capturing the, the more elaborate set of numbers, but oftentimes you can do a good job by just having a two or a three-dimensional solution, and if there's a lot of stress in this two-dimensional solution, for example, because these countries are actually positioned in three dimensions on the Earth, not just in two dimensions, then you might have to pop up to a third dimension in order to represent them more accurately. And that depends upon how faithful a representation of the distance matrix you need in your geometric solution. Um, and it will be revealed by um, what we tend to consider the, the elbow in the uh, the curve of stress. So this is stress on my vertical axis, and this is the number of dimensions that we have in our solution. And very often when you fit multidimensional scaling, you'll say, ah, yes, our stress is dramatically improving from one dimension to two dimension, maybe from two dimension to three dimension, and then oftentimes it levels off. And that's an indicator that there's not much point in going beyond three dimensions. Okay, so that's another use of multidimension to actually figure out how many dimensions people have in mind when they think of these objects. Um, for our purpose right here, for generalized context model, we're very interested in creating a numeric representation of each of our concepts. And that is what we're going to feed into our, our model that'll give us the actual distance 
or inversely related similarity between two concepts. Um, now, the other thing that I wanted to point out, oh, there's, there is one other thing that I wanted to point out here. Um, so there is, so one of the things that I said, which might have been a little bit cryptic before, is Roger Shepard showed this um, exponential generalization law, um, and I kind of fit in there this idea that this is a law that applies to distances as computed in psychological spaces to, on the vertical axis, we have the degree of generalization from one thing to another thing, right? And this notion of psychological space is exactly what we're capturing by this multidimensional scaling. Okay, so I just sort of slipped that in because you might have said, what do you mean by a psychological space? And it might be related to stuff that Dr. Gordon Force, Gordon Force will be talking about um, tomorrow. Um, but for our purposes here, what we mean by a psychological space is just the distance between um, two concepts here, two, here, let me do concepts here, two concepts like um, pigeon and parrot in this multidimensional space derived solution. So you have to first do the MDS before you can figure out what are the psychological distances. And those are the ones that are exponentially related to generalization. Okay. Um, the final thing that I should say is actually how do we compute the distance between, oh, I sort of was already assuming, when I, when I was um, calculating the distance between pigeon and parrot here, um, I was actually uh, assuming implicitly a Euclidean distance. And it's not unusual to do that. That's the one that you're taught in fifth grade. Um, but this is our generalized distance um, calculation. Um, it's known um, by, I call it the, the Minkowski um, family of distance metrics. Um, if you're from computer science, you'll oftentimes call this L1 norms and L2 norms, same thing. Um, so we're going to be calculating the distance now between whatever I said, pigeon and parrot. Yeah, pigeon and parrot, for example, that's I and J, is going to be um, found by summing up all of the dimensions. So we're going to find for pigeon and for pigeon and rabbit, rabbit, pigeon and parrot, all of their coordinate values. So they, in this case, they have two dimensions. So they have an x and a y coordinate, and we're going to take their value on the x coordinate. For example, the first time we do this, this will be the x coordinate. We find the value, just the Cartesian coordinate of pigeon, um, minus the Cartesian coordinate for for parrot, and we're going to raise it to um, a, a power of r. Okay, um, and then um, we're going to, to weight it. And this is related to the question back there. This would be the, the MDS way of answering that question. And it might not satisfy you, but maybe this would be a good way of maybe re-asking the question. Um, so the weight here is giving us a weight for different dimensions. So for some purposes, we might assume that the X dimension, I don't know, was that ferocity or size, um, might be more important to people than the Y dimension. And this is your chance to give those weights. Um, one of the assumptions in the application of similarity-based models like this is oftentimes that if you give people a particular categorization rule, then they're going to selectively weight the dimensions according to their diagnosticity for that categorization. If you give people a categorization rule that splits the items like, like this, then you'll end up weighting more the x dimension compared to the y dimension. Okay, so you'll give a bigger value for the 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 w associated with x is going to be bigger than the w associated with y, and that turns out to be critically important because you can give different subjects different categorization rules, and if they weren't able to weight selectively these derived dimensions, then they wouldn't be nearly as adaptive as they should be for learning the categories efficiently. <laughs>
So I think that's one of the discoveries from cognitive psychology is we have this um, very efficient ability to selectively attend to dimensions, at least in some cases. Um, okay, so after we do this weighting operation then, um, we're going to find this uh, exponentiated version of, of all of the differences between the values across all of the different dimensions. Here we only have x and y. And at the very end, we'll raise things to the, the 1 over r power. Now, if we let r equal to 2, then we are in our well-known world of Euclid, right? And that is the world where if I have an object here and an object here in a psychological space, then we're going to compute the distance just by the straight line connecting them, all right? But we also are interested in situations where, for example, r equals 1. r equals 1 is known as a, a city block metric it is a, a proper metric if you know math. It follows still the metric properties of, of distances. So it, those properties I could go into, but they're things that you'd probably want to subscribe to. Like the distance from A to itself is zero. The distance from A to B is the same as the distance from B to A. And there's one other property called the triangle inequality. Um, so in our Euclid world, this is how we calculate the distance between these points. Um, if r equals 1, then the way that we would compute these um, distances is by actually going all the way over on the x dimension and then all the way up on the y dimension. And the metaphor to a city block is if you live in Manhattan, um, you have all of these pesky buildings that are in between the streets. And so if you actually want to get between uh, two points, you actually have to avoid the buildings, otherwise you'll make your nose bloody. And you have to go along the streets and the avenues in order to get to your destination. So you have to go the, the long way around along the dimensions. Um, and I'm bringing this up because because it turns out that there's um, interesting systematicities between different dimensions. Um, so some, dif some dimensions seem to be better, they are better approximated by assuming that the psychological metric underlying them is r equals 2, and other dimensions are well approximated by r equals 1. Um, and here, I'm just giving an example from, from our own research. Um, it turns out that if you have two dimensions that are what um, Wendell Garner would call separable dimensions, um, then it seems like the best way to calculate the distance between them is by assuming that we're using a city block, r equals 1 metric. So if I want to calculate the the psychological difference between this object and this object, then it's as if I add their difference on size to their difference on brightness, right? And the argument is that this makes sense because we naturally think of our world as having objects that vary in brightness and size. Um, and it's hard to think of those both varying at the same time. Whereas for other dimensions, like saturation and brightness, um, those are, I can flesh this out if you want, but saturation and brightness are psychological dimensions that are related to physical dimensions in the world. This is the world of psychometrics, as we call it in, in cognitive psychology. Um, saturation is a psychological dimension related to um, the amount of monochromatic light in a color. Brightness is a psychological dimension related to the, the luminance energy coming off of a color. So um, there are two different components of colors. There's another component that you know if you've um, done uh, messed around with graphics, which is which is actually the hue or the primary wavelength. Um, we're not paying attention to that here. My point is that if I want to think about the the similarity or difference between this swatch and this swatch. In this case, you can do a better job of uh, modeling people's 
confusions, people's discrimination errors, or their similarity judgments by taking the beeline path <laughs> by r equals 2 rather than r equals 1. And the reasoning here is that it's not even clear that people have a separate psychological representation for saturation and brightness. They seem to us, and they also seem to psychometricians, to be fused together dimensions so that you can think about combining across both saturation and brightness in figuring out the, the differences between objects. So th this is an interesting method. Um, uh, it's been used to look at differences in expertise. So color experts, if they're vision scientists, or some kinds of painters, like we saw last night, perhaps, uh, they seem to have color judgments that are better approximated by R equals 1 rather than R equals 2. If they spent a lot of their livelihood uh, making distinctions between saturation and brightness. So there are definitely expertise effects on this where a lot of what learning amounts to is taking dimensions that used to be psychologically fused together and treating them as separate. If you're an onophile, then you, um, maybe you can taste the, just the tannin content in a wine. Right? That would be another example of pulling out the tannin taste um, or the corkiness from a wine, maybe, or something like that. Um, and that would be another case of d differentiation of dimensions. Um, and that has nothing to do with, um, this is maybe a contentious point, but I believe it. I, I think the experiments bear me out. And this has nothing to do with selective attention in an interesting way. So your ability to separate out brightness from saturation is um, different from your ability to pay attention to saturation. In fact, it's sort of, I think I could say this, that your ability to selectively attend to saturation and ignore brightness depends upon an earlier ability that you've developed, usually over much longer training, to have separate saturation and brightness dimensions, psychologically speaking. Um, another way of putting that is that y you can create really essentially new channels inside your, your brain in terms of perceptual processing. And if you don't give yourself the right experience, if you give yourself regular experience like most of us have, then saturation and brightness will be joined together. But if you give yourself the right kind of experience, then you can end up with more differentiated representations of these. And once you get that, once you have a separate saturation channel, then you have the ability to decide whether you're going to attend to it or not. Okay. Um, this uh, question so far, yeah. So, right, yeah, good, yeah, right. So, so I, the way I would put it is there are two different um, perceptual mechanisms that allow our perceptual systems to better connect to the concepts that we need to learn. Um, one kind of mechanism is just selective attention, so that if I need to um, go shopping and I need to categorize my world in terms of ripe versus unripe avocados, then uh, color is very relevant. I think that's the only, <laughs> it's the only dimension I use when I'm trying to, to pick my avocado, <laughs> to categorize the, the good avocados. Um, and when I'm trying to uh, categorize something as a book, color is completely irrelevant. So there's no reason to pay attention to color because books come in all kinds of colors. Um, so if I want to learn one of those categories versus the other, then I want to selectively attend to either color or 
shape somehow for Buck. Um, and so that's one kind of skill, but it's a very different kind of skill to have separated out two different dimensions. So in order to decide, I'm just going to pay attention to the color of, of an avocado, that presumes, it assumes that I've already got a color channel. Um, is, are people comfortable with my use of the word channel? I mean, a, a sort of a detector, a separate perceptual pathway for, for processing color. Some of these are given to us endogenously. Some of these are created through learning. I think that's, that's my big point, is you can create new channels through learning, which is kind of a, a deep point, really. Um, and so you can create a new color channel. In fact, there's interesting um, evidence from children, which is, it, it feels really weird, but there's a lot of evidence from children in terms of their sorting judgments, in terms of their confusions, that would suggest that children have not perfectly segregated out their world into color and shape. It's very hard for children to make a judgment about the shape of objects being the same, ignoring their color variation. Right? And that, it feels exotic, right? We say, come on, you can tell them part. But apparently if you're uh, one and a half, two years old, all the way up to three years old, it's hard to do that. So there is, I think, an, a good description of a lot of experience which would su suggest that dimensions that we take for granted are actually an intellectual achievement to have segregated. So the other mechanism then is this mechanism of differentiating the world into channels. So selective attention depends upon a previous effort to do this differentiation. Yeah? Um, so we just talked about that uh, learning uh, means or might mean getting new dimensions. So this might also change all the distance measures. Because if I have more dimensions and I have more ways, uh, which, which could be uh, like a different distance between the objects, um, so, so for me, this distance measure is just a very, um, it's, it's, it's one point in time where this might apply for one specific situation or context. So I don't really see where the big use for this MDS yeah. So, yeah, I completely agree with everything you said there. I think it, it's a really deep and important point, except for your final sentence of not, <laughs> of not seeing the use of it, because you can, you can see systematically how these different MDS solutions change as a function of people's context or as a function of people's experience. And a good way to give a gloss on how people differ from each other is by seeing differences in their multidimensional scaling solutions. Um, a couple of examples of this, people have done experiments cross-culturally looking at how the solutions vary for things like animals. Um, when you put one single individual in different perspectives. Like you're thinking of this as a cook or you're thinking of this as a biologist. How would you rate the similarities? People change a lot. And you can understand the differences both within and across people by the differences in their solution. Um, one of the uh, uh, derivative techniques for multidimensional scaling is called individual scaling. Um, and in individual scaling, you have two different time slices of the same person or two different people. Um, and you will constrain both of those solutions or all of the solutions to basically use the same coordinates. And then you can understand the differences between people in terms of the weighting, the W terms, if you will, between uh, different dimensions across the people. So you can say this type of people carry, carry, or care more about the ferocity of the animals. Um, and then the second thing to say about this is sometimes you can explain differences between people very well just by saying, yeah, they've got the same basic solution. You just stretch and shrink the axes differently for the people. And that's the assumption of uh, in scale, as it's called, 
individual scaling. And um, it uses a method called procrustes, which basically, like, like the, the Greek king, I guess, is constraining everybody's solutions in a, in a particular way um, and by doing the stretching and doing the shrinking, um, maybe in a less macabre way than procrustes did. You can, you can Google him if you don't know him. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, the other thing I can say, though, is sometimes, maybe more interestingly for you, is it doesn't suffice to explain the differences between two different groups of people just by stretching and shrinking the dimensions. It really looks like sometimes people are using a different dimension, right? And that would also show up as high stress when you do the Procrustes method for individual scaling. So it can be used as a way of revealing the insufficiencies itself of doing the, the scaling, if that. OK, cool. So, um, so where were we? So this is all the, the long-winded way of telling us how we derive the, the distances between these objects. The distances, just to go backwards now, will feed into the similarities between the objects, and those are what's going to determine your choice probabilities. Um, and um, I could give the worked out example. I think this might be better for, it's less, and it's kind of boring. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. But if you look in the notes, I work out an example of how to actually apply a generalized context model to um, figure out what, what the heck is this gerbil thing. And so I just gave a simple example where I, there's um, a known um, set of objects like dog and raccoon, cat, bear, and gerbil. And I just decide, hey, look, dog and cat belong in the same category. Maybe that's a category of pet. Um, maybe raccoon and bear belong in another category. And I'm interested in saying, what is this gerbil thing? Should it be put in the same category as the dog and the cat, or as the raccoon and the bear. And the point being, if you have the full um, similarity or distance matrix between all of these objects, so I created this in my mind's eye just by giving similarity ratings. So I thought dog to, to cat, um, that's pretty similar, so I'll give it a low number. I'll give that a, a, a rating of three. Dogs, uh, they're not so much like bears. So if you can supply all of these numbers, for example, by asking people in a psychological experiment to see what is the similarity between all of these objects to each other. Or also in a psychological experiment, um, asking people to um, look at pictures of these objects and um, they have to quickly decide whether the object they see is, for example, a dog versus a gerbil. You can use the response time that it takes them to say dog as an indicator of how confusable the dog is from the, the gerbil. Right. So those are some ways of psychologically assessing the similarities between objects that could be used to populate this distance metric. Um, what's um, more commonly used these days is um, allowing the world to provide us these similarity ratings. Um, so I don't think I probably have to describe latent semantic analysis. Are there people out there? who don't know what latent semantic analysis is um, and are not afraid to admit it? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, OK, so, I, so everybody kind of knows this. Well, I guess we've been calling these um, distributional methods in, in linguistics. Um, so psychologists were originally using latent semantic analysis as a way of getting coordinate representations for a whole bunch of words. Um, the only problem. I mean, and latent semantic analysis had a number of early victories. It passed uh, a TOEFL test for English as a second language. Um, when 
I've tried to use it. I've been shocked at how bad the representations are. Um, so I would not actually recommend that you go back and use this. Don't, don't buy, this is, I guess, generally true. Don't buy the, um, the advertisements that you've heard that this is like a really great method for high resolution, uh, semantic representations. Um, Word to Vec and Glove are more recent possibilities that are doing something similar. They're giving you quantitative measurements of the, the similarity relations, hopefully, between words. So they're certainly better than LSA, should you believe the advertisements uh, associated with them. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. That's an exercise for the reader. Yeah. Yeah, so right, so right, so that, right. It can, then it is as good as um, glove then, or? Uh -huh. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Same issues applied to glove and word to back. Uh huh, uh huh. And interestingly, word to back and glove completely break down this model, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like completely. Oh! Sure, right. When I was imagining the application of them to um, something like um, my gerbil example, I was imagining taking a huge corpora and then just selecting out for categorization experiments the, the items I wanted to know. And, that, but, and so that's a, a, a really deep point, though, that you actually get better psychologically correlative distance measures when you actually have a subset of words that are embedded in a larger set of words. That's, that's a really neat point. So not only are you getting benefit from the indirect co-occurrence relations, but the, the representations that you're getting to, for the distance between gerbil and dog is actually being improved because you also have distance assessments between llamas and door handles, right? So that's, that's neat, I think. And, but but it's, I think it's completely true. Okay, um, this is actually a, a good point for questions before we go on. Yeah. But, you know, in a case where you see something totally new, you're not really sure what it even is, um, how do you go about picking what categories to compare to? Is there something? Yeah. So that, yeah, that's a really great and deep question, um, and one that the cognitive psychologists have cleverly tried to avoid by, as you say, giving people the set of items that they have to categorize and the categories. So we're saying, hey, we're giving you a, a categorization between pets and non-pets. But there is this bigger question that, uh, that is of relevance for like uh, psycholinguistics, which is if you just show people an object and you ask people what it is, um, once there's different solutions to that. You, you, haven't, you haven't articulated explicitly what the, the contrast set is of other objects. One solution to that is just to use the numerator in this formula. So you could do this just by looking at the similarity to a category in order to figure out how likely will people be to give that label. Another possibility, which is, which is very interesting, I associate with like Dennis Norris, is that maybe objects will recruit their own contrast sets. So um, maybe there's a, a small amount of bottom-up processing that you can do for presenting people a chair that will recruit a set of possible alternative categories. Maybe it's a chair, maybe it's a table, but I'll never even consider the possibility that it's a llama. And so you may be able to use bottom-up characteristics of the images in order to figure out what are the reasonable candidate sets. And then you can populate the denominator here with what those candidate sets are. So those, that's, uh, and so that's a really interesting deep point because it, it, it raises the, the idea that um, 
objects are going to be particularly described by diagnostic features that they have relative to their nearest neighbors in some sort of high dimensional object space. So by that account, you know, like crocodiles are particularly close to alligators. And so if they have slightly longer snouts than, uh, if alligators have slightly longer snouts than crocodiles, then that will be a particularly important dimension for evaluating them if you have to choose between them. Right? So I, I kind of like this idea that you don't have to presume uh, what is a diagnostic dimension ahead of time, but that could come along for the ride once you figure out what are the, the likely suspect other categories. Yeah, there, there was another question. Yeah. Um, we didn't talk that much about the disadvantages of NDS. So can you tell us some? Okay, so... Um, there, there's different ways of answering that question. Um, so in some ways, I, the, the most immediate disadvantage is it is assumes a dimensional structure. It assumes that you have a bunch of objects that, um, that can be compared for their, their distances. So uh, maybe I'll go back to this. <laughs> so you end up with this um, dimensional representation where you might be able to interpret, I think we were sort of successful for the, the case of the animals where there was something that seemed to uh, go along with domesticity. So these are nice domesticated animals. These are more wild animals. And it is, so it assumes that your concepts can be described along these continuous dimensions. And that is not always a reasonable assumption. And there is other mathematical tools for dimensionally reducing distance matrices that do not assume that. And um, there is another set of, of methods um, that are really interesting, for some reason a lot less used than multidimensional scaling, and I think it's mostly sociologically, um, is additive clustering methods. And what additive clustering methods do is they just postulate, instead of postulating dimensions, they're going to be postulating features that objects may either partake of or not partake of, right? And so you could have features um, that, well, I mean, I guess we've seen that with like the Jakobsen and Hollis stuff, very much like, um, like that animate or not or we could have male or not. So those are fairly discrete features. And the interesting empirical observation is that sets of concepts that are well accounted for by additive clustering are not well accounted for by multidimensional scaling and vice versa. It seems like some concepts, it's better to think about them as having features that are either present or absent in them, and other concepts that seem to be better described by these continuous dimensions. So, um, so the first thing to say is that MDS is assuming this kind of dimensional solution. There are other, there are other methods that will combine, allow you to, if, if you give it a, a set where objects uh, have both discrete features that are present or absent and dimensions, it can do both of those. The other kind of variant that f uh, fits in maybe with um, some of Dr. Feldbaum's work is there's a variant of additive feature clustering, which assumes that the features can also be hierarchically arranged. So it'll create a feature um, of um, you know long snout versus small snout, but then within that it'll be in uh, another class of features that are animate versus inanimate, right? And so there's those are called hierarchical clustering algorithms. So they are like um, the multidimensional scaling algorithm at a high level because they're saying there's late, you know, there's these hidden latent variables, either dimensions where objects are ordered along them, or features that are either present or absent, and we're going to postulate these things, and we're going to use those to, to um, account for our concepts, to model the concepts. The deeper answer to what you're saying is that everything that I've talked about so far, uh, this is 
additive feature clustering, hierarchical clustering models, multidimensional scaling models, all of them are assuming that these latent variables are kind of additive. You can just sort of decide um, they're independent of each other. You're, defi you're defining the value of one, and then you can de define the value along another one of them. And they get both their power, but also their relative uh, lack of structure from that property. So you're able to say, um, well, you know, we can talk about the, the ferocity of an animal independently of its size. Um, and it does a good job of picking out those dimensions that are relatively independent, isolatable components from each other, also true for feature models. But um, if you're talking about concepts that I would think of as more structured, like, what does it mean to be like an orbital system? What does it mean to be a sanctuary? What does it mean for somebody to betray somebody else? These are structured kinds of things. And there's good reason to think that um, these flat representations, like multidimensional scaling, are going to do a poor job of, of modeling those. So that, I think that's the deeper point. They, because they may or may not be interpretable. Yeah. You mean? Yeah. You can. So yeah. I think. The risk of that not being able to, to interpret. Yeah, and depending upon your purpose, that may or may not be important. If all you want to do is figure out what category something belongs in, you might not need to interpret these dimensions. Um, it, you might say, well, you know, there's probably a lot of situations where people have this intuitive idea for what the similarity is between these objects, and they would have a hard time putting it into words themselves. But yeah, so I, I think that's right. Um, there, I don't know about the success of this work. But I know that there is, well, OK, let me put it, the, the, this I do know. <laughs> um, there is definitely interest in doing certain operations to the solutions for multidimensional scaling that will um, maximize within some constraints, the interpretability of those. So you can have people list what are the dimensions or features of importance for a set of objects like animals, and you can rotate the axes of the solutions in a rigid way so that they will best align with those verbal judgments that people give. That's a common way of increasing the interpretability of the dimensions. Yeah. I think of them, so I know they're used on the same kind of input representations. So they, so you can 
simply apply um, a hierarchical clustering algorithm to the same kind of uh, distance matrix that you can apply uh, um, uh, multidimensional scaling to. There's, so yeah, I, I'm, I tend to be a lumper, and I tend to think about them at a high level as being similar. You were talking about categorization information being all that you needed to do hierarchical clustering, but there's a lot of uses of categorizing data from subjects or from humans in general um, as the input to multidimensional scaling also. Um, one of the primary measures is the number, like if you asked people just to free sort a whole bunch of objects, put these objects into groups, um, you can use as a measure of their um, dissimilarity to fill in this matrix like that, um, you can use the number of times where two objects co-occur in a free sort category. So, so yeah, I tend to think of them as taking similar inputs, but I, I agree with you that they're having different psychological assumptions about how these objects are being represented, either in terms of features, hierarchically arranged features, or, or dimensions, at least. I don't know, but yeah, maybe, I, we can talk about it, because I, I, maybe I ha haven't done it justice. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, is that, do you think that's like specific to verbal fluency, or is that just because it's like you have, you have to have a certain number of responses or a certain, I guess I'm just wondering, like, I don't only, it sounds like MBS is positive in the field and useful, but the only information that I've seen from it is that it's inconsistent and unreliable. Uh huh. Well, I mean, this might relate to the earlier question. Um, what you are calling inconsistent could be taken as data if you can show systematic differences in the multidimensional scaling solutions between different populations. Then that's information. Right, but they're not. I mean, so the studies uh -huh. that I've run on it is that you know, if we have a hundred people to the eye and we and we pull you know ten or fifteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I would generally say that, you know, MDS is a technique, and depending upon your experiments, depending upon what your, um, your, your task is that you're giving people to do, it may or may not be giving you good data. It may speak just as much to the data you've decided to collect your empirical protocol. But if it's, you know, if it's garbage in, it's going to be garbage out. Um, I mean, one thing that I, I should say, um, um, it, I was making an assumption in interpreting the, the output from multidimensional scaling that what you should be interpreting is the, the dimensional Cartesian coordinates. You should be interpreting the x and the y value, right? Um, and that is just a... a, a I think it's a bias that um, scientists have from seeing the power of Cartesian graphs. There's no reason why MDS plots have to be interpreted in terms of their Cartesian coordinates. And there's been some famous cases um, from Roger Shepard himself um, where it seems like you can better interpret the solutions in terms of like polar coordinates. Like if you give people um, uh, pitches you know, like C, D, E, I'm not going to sing them, you don't want to hear that, um, and you give them several octaves, it turns out that the multidimensional scaling solution, if you plot it in three dimensions, looks like a corkscrew. 
It's a helix going upwards. And you can well account for what that is, is one dimension is sort of the pitch height. And then you have a circular arrangement of the, the pitches within a, in, the, in the XY world. So you'd really want one coordinate for um, the, the distance outwards, which is the amplitude of the pitch. Another coordinate, which is the polar coordinate, which is saying where you are on the circle going around a, a, a specific octave. And then you have another dimension, which is the octave. So it's, I think it's a, it's a really deep point, but um, this, this is, it's only giving you a, a metric space. And how you're interpreting that metric space is up to you. And so you, you should be looking at these with some creativity, I think. And it speaks to the, the interpretability question as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So you're right. So that's absolutely right. If you're using these things empirically, um, and this is this is true for a lot of the deep learning systems too, in principal component analysis, what you tend to find is that you can give a readily available interpretation to the first dimension, the first two dimension. But then when you're picking up relatively small amounts of additional variance, you'll find it very hard to interpret dimension six and seven. Um, and you may still be getting um, significant proportions of variance accounted for by including six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you should include them. But my experience is you should stop probably trying to spend too much time trying to, to figure out exactly what's going on in them. They, they, those later dimensions, and it's an interesting, um, maybe a psychological fact, that things that take up more proportion of variance are actually opening themselves up, making themselves available to be interpreted. Um, okay, great. Um, how much more time do I have? Hmm, ten? Four. Four. Okay, um, that's great. Um, so I'm just going to introduce um, my next topic then, um, just to say what I in interpreted my charge to be. So the organizers, in their inestimable wisdom, wanted us to talk about um, um, applications of concepts. Um, and I think this is smart. I think it's a great idea uh, by way of um, potentially inoculating us to discussions that might otherwise be unhelpfully abstract. <laughs> I know. Um, some people have heard my... <laughs> my uh, uncertainty about what, what we even mean by the word abstract. So I interpreted my charge to be um, taken from the world of, of education, uh, which I dabble in. And so what do we know from cognitive science about how to actually teach people concepts better, more efficiently? Um, and so there, I could have interpreted it in lots of different ways. I could have talked about applications of multidimensional scaling, which are, are all over the place, um, uh, applications of models of categorization in, in machine learning. But I guess I am also a cognitive psychologist. Um, and so I was trying to comb the literature on things that I think have gotten a, a fair body of evidence in favor of them. Um, there's, of course, going to be lots of um, differences in different studies. There's lots of null effects that we are no longer ashamed to bring to the table in this age of enlightened replicability and robust research. Um, but um, I, so I was sort of constraining myself in some ways. I was trying to pick things that 
cognitive psychologists have found semi-reliably across different contexts, across different types of materials to confer benefits when people are learning concepts. Um, and I was also somewhat biased to um, avoid things like, um, I guess, what I would consider social psychology, um, like issues of motivation. So, um, and I can't say that like motivation is unimportant. I think it's super important for learning. Um, I don't really have anything to say about it. It's hard to find good things to say about motivation. Um, how to get people to be motivated to learn concepts, to learn them deeply, whatever the hell we mean by deep in, in, in that sense. Um, so, uh, the, I, so I just wanted to give a, a sort of preamble on the kinds of things that I was combing the literature looking for and what's in here in this list and not in this list. Um, what is not in this list is things like um, identity, um, uh, um, motivation, um, incentive structures. So uh, that I will leave to other kinds of psychologists that are probably not even represented in this room. So so um, some of these I got from uh, an report, a report that was commissioned um, by Perspectives on Psychological Science on things that improve learning. Um, but I had to go beyond that also because in many cases I found what they were focusing on was what I would classify as rote memorization. So there's things like, you know, spacing out materials rather than massing them all together. But um, many of the tests for that were just how well could you remember a particular pairing between a Swahili word and an English word, right? And so my perspective is also going to be one that probably a lot of us share in this room, which is I'm particularly interested in transfer rather than rote learning. I'm interested in teaching people concepts so that they can take the learned concepts and apply it in a, a new situation or a new domain. All right, so I'm being told by Minya to stop the second, and so you can get a sort of a, a foreshadowing of what I'll be talking about, um, I think, not tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>